why don't we get started here? Welcome, ladies. I think we might have a couple people trickling in, but it's week six, so it should probably be our smallest group. <laughs> but um, yeah, thank you all so much for making it this far, for being here all the way to the end, guys. Um, let me just open us in prayer real quick. Dearly Father, Lord, we surrender to you, God. We just thank you for humbling us and teaching us in these past six, six weeks, God. I just pray that you would just quiet our hearts just um, and just open our hearts, um, quiet our minds, open our hearts to what you have to teach us today, God, and just hide me up here and just, uh, God, just use me to... Um, proclaim who you are in the fullness and most wonderful way. Um, God, we just, we give you this time, Lord. Amen. Okay, so chapter 10, week six, God uh, is sovereign. He is the God of infinite rule. So I hope that in reading chapter 10 this week, you guys have seen that everything we read over the course of the past six weeks has been building to this moment, <laughs> um, all the attributes of God, his incommunicable, incommunicable, so those attributes that he alone has, uh, these have led us to the ultimate conclusion that God has the ability and the authority, the, or the ability and the authority to inhabit his throne as ruler of the universe. So whatever he wills, he does. Um, he does not lack power in any capacity or wisdom in any capacity to enact his will. And his limitlessness in all of these areas confirms that. So um, I want to keep, you know, our lesson today on his sovereignty a, a little bit short. I wanted to talk briefly just a little bit about his active will versus passive will because... Um, that's the one area of this chapter that I think was possibly maybe not a little clear. Um, these are very lofty theological concepts that, you know, theologians try to explain in <laughs> more palatable ways. But um, we are talking about some of the biggest mysteries, these what Jen, I believe, calls parallel truths about God's sovereignty and then our free will, how these two coexist in the same reality or coexist in the universe. How is God fully sovereign over everything, but we can still make choices? He He's given us free will. So how does that work together? Um, but yes, um, I think a lot of what we can glean from his sovereignty, I think we can, can in group discussion. So I just want to talk about this a little bit before we uh, break up into groups. But his his moral will and his or well, his, his active will and his passive will. Uh, theologians will sometimes call it uh, something different since passive is a kind of a word that has connotations that uh, it, it, it's, he's not doing anything about it. Um, or, you know, it's just, you, you can quibble with the use of his passive will a little bit. So what uh, most the, uh, other theologians will call it his moral will and his stated will. So his, his stated will is something that God says, this is true. It's true always. It's uh, things in his stated will would be like the, the wages of sin is death, or I will never flood the earth again, or uh, something that he says will pass, has passed, or is going to pass. Jesus, his stated will is that Jesus is going to come back um, and, and rule and set up his kingdom here on earth. So that is his stated will. God's moral will is things that he said, says where he has given us in his sovereignty, he has given us free choice to decide to obey or disobey his moral will. So his moral will would be things like, uh, do not, like our 10 commandments, do not steal, do not lie, do not murder. But as we know, <laughs> fallen sinful humans do, do all those things. We break, we, and we break his commandments and we disobey his moral will 
um, on a daily basis. That is that is sin. Um, so. God's moral will is that none of us as humans would lie or covet or look at pornography or, or, or lust or steal or all the other things that he wills and his Bible commands us not to do. Um, but we know that is not the case, that we are perfectly obedient to his moral will. Um, so, yeah, as Jen states, there's kind of a, a, a parallel... Uh, these truths exist in parallel. God is sovereign over everything. He has the authority to do what he wants. He has the power to do what he wants. He is sovereign over everything. But in his sovereignty, he has extended to us free will. And I believe Tozer, in trying to untangle this whole ball of theology, said, um, you know, in his sovereignty, our free will and our exercise of free will and choice in the areas that he has allowed us to have free will and choice is therefore fulfilling his sovereignty. <laughs> so, um, because it was in his sovereignty that he decided that um, since he is not a, an authoritative commanding parent, that he was going to give us um, in, in love, give us the right to choose him, give, give us the right to choose to follow him. Um, so really, it comes from a, pa a place of love. You know, he, he, he loves us and therefore gives us the opportunity to partake in his freedom a little bit um, in, in the capacity that what we are able to choose, we are able to choose. Um, but, but yeah, so that's a little bit on his sovereignty and how that relates to our free will. Um, but yeah, so just wanted to talk very briefly about that. That's that's all I really have on sovereignty before we break into group discussion. Um, I will wrap up at the end after we do our group discussion. So uh, here are our group questions. So if you are looking at page... Uh, let me see. Oh, went too far. Pages 45 through 48, where it talks about um, how we as humans will try to exert control or an obsessive control over certain areas of our lives. Um, you know, controlling our bodies, controlling our possessions, controlling our relationships, or controlling our circumstances or environments. So the question one is, which category do you fall into most? So if someone has a scratch sheet of paper, sorry, I didn't print out group discussion questions this week. Um, I'll write it on the board. Let's just do that. So question one is, which category do you fall into most? And let me write that up. Question two is, Looking back at our whole study, what is one area of your life that you feel God pressing you to surrender to his sovereignty? Or where are you trying to be limitless like God, where he has rightfully limited you? And question number three is, what is a promise of God that you need to trust that it is his will to fulfill and not rely on your own striving? And question number four is written up here at the top. Um, so whichever, um, whichever attribute was kind of maybe most interesting to you or most complicated for you to try and wrap your head around, maybe discuss that at your table. Um, and then we can bring that back to the group. So I'm going to write these up on the board, but, um, yeah, so we will discuss all these questions together as a whole. Um, so um, try to get through all of them as you can. I'm sure we will have plenty of time. But yes, this first question, what category do you fall into most trying to control your body, your possessions, your relationships, or your circumstances? That's kind of where we can discuss God's sovereignty and really get into that. So yeah, um, we, I believe, um, I think it was maybe like week one, week two or three, our table back there, I don't remember who was the, back there, but we, we got onto the topic of the transformative nature of gazing on God, at God. Um, and it's talked about either in first or second Corinthians. I have to, I can see the page of my Bible. I don't remember where it is, but if I 
had my Bible with me and remembered to bring it. I don't have it saved on my phone. I know where it is in my Bible, but in First or Second Corinthians, it talks about um, we are um, in the in the verse. You know, it talks about the transformative nature. Like we, as we gaze on our Creator, we become like Him. We are mirrors reflecting Him, and you know, a, a mirror reflecting dimly is kind of. Um, you know, how you can see it, but we are being transformed when, when, when we are gazing on our creator, because, you know, I, I said, we become what we behold. And, and that is so true of, um, beholding Christ, because the more we behold him, the more time we spend in his word, beholding him, um, the more we are transformed and the more that transformation becomes outwardly visible to, um, to others. And, you know, the outflowing of love and joy and peace is what makes a Christian coming into a space of darkness so undeniably uplifting because um, I, I've i talked about this before because it's one of my absolutely favorite ways that God describes himself. God describes himself as light. And I had a friend who was a biology major explained <laughs> kind of the science behind light. Um, and light is, is, a, is a physical property that's unlike sound in that it moves in waves and it's unlike particles in that it moves in, can move in any direction. So it can move in waves and it can move in any direction. But the, if studying the properties of light, um, to understand darkness, darkness, darkness is the absence of light. And so God chose to describe himself as light because anywhere that light is, a particle of light, one, one particle of light in a dark space makes the darkness less dark because there is no way that darkness can push out light. Light only pushes out darkness. And I think, you know, that's one of the reasons why we're called to be a light to the world because we are going to dark places all the time. And when we are outpouring God and his character and we are outpouring his love and his peace and his joy wherever we go, we are pouring his light into the darkness and the darkness cannot push out the light. Um, it's, 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 it's a physically quantifiably impossible in the nature of his world. And that's one of the reasons, one of the, one of the ways he chose to describe himself, which I think is just amazing because, you know, it, we talk about God creating an ordered universe, but even in his ordered universe, he chooses such amazing ways to describe himself. Anyways. Okay. I was not even planning to talk about that, but, but that's just like one of my like favorite quali qualities of God is that he calls himself light. Anyways, and light is amazing. Question two, answering question two, like which area is God pressing me to surrender to his sovereignty? It's definitely his omniscience or not necessarily surrendering to his sovereignty, but that's an area that I strive to be limitless in. I I was telling them I'm, I'm a very curious person and, you know, I like to have all the answers. And part of that curiosity, you know, has led me to a love of his word, which has led me to a deeper love of God. But in areas not of his word where, where I have anxiety, I, I try to have all the knowledge about things before I make decisions and things like that. And so, yeah, like... I also want to know everything there is to know about God. <laughs> that, so, so when you say he's not, he's incomprehensible, I'm like, yeah. I'm like, I want to know all the secrets. I want to know, I want everything about God to fit neatly and tidy into a sermon, into a book that I can understand. I want the theologians, theologians to come up with very, very easy to understand ways of explaining uh, the the complex truths of Scripture, but. You know, a part of me is like, you know, you it needs to s surrender, you know, my pride in my intellect that to to be like, no, if you if God revealed these things to you, your brain would explode. <laughs> you know, it's like, you know, so yeah, that's definitely that's a fun attribute of him, and definitely an attribute where I had to be like, yeah, I don't like that. <laughs> I need a I need to really need, you know, because. Yeah, it's tough. I come from a family that has a lot of very intellectual people in it. And, you know, 
it, it's tough because a lot of times people look down on you if you believe something based on faith. And there are elements, you know, it would not be, we, we would not be commanded to have faith um, in the things that are unseen, um, waiting patiently for the full truth to be real, revealed to us if he was going to reveal it to all, all of us in this time. And, you know, he very well, he could come down and sit down my very intelligent family members and give them a reason by reason, step by step. Here's, here's all your questions, like answered to everything, you know, just, but you know, there, there are things we don't know. And I think that requires humility and, and, and intellectual humility is often looked down on by people who are secular intellectual pe into people who are like, we can know everything. We we're humanity. We can figure it all out. We have science and telescopes and microscopes and everything. And we can, we can look at anything. We can apply an equation and know it all. Um, but in, in reality, we are all still just woefully, you know, just scratching the surface of all there is to know in the universe. Um, but yeah. Anything else before we wrap up? Um, so our end goal, um, everything that we've been working towards, um, what she set out in the uh, introduction was to develop a fear of the Lord. And if you guys will remember, I think back to week one, but yes, but week one, <laughs> our first, first night together, we talked about the different kinds of fear of the Lord. There's, um, in the Hebrew, there was the fear of punishment, um, the fear, um, of breaking God's commandments, but we're not talking about fear of the Lord in those sense. We're talking about a profound reverence for life that comes from rightly seeing. Wonder, amazement, awe, mystery, astonishment, gratitude, and admiration. These are the fear of the Lord um, should bring these um, things to mind. Um, so I love what you guys were saying at this table, just how how it can change <laughs> your whole perspective by gazing on God. So. When we experience the awe of rightly seeing the true nature of God, um, to quote Jen on page 154, we become less individualistic, less self-focused, less, less materialistic, and more connected to those around us. So apparently there, she, there was a footnote, I didn't go check her on it, but apparently that is a, a, a studied thing that, you know, when we observe art and redwoods and all that kind of thing, um, that we become less uh, self-focused, but, um, but yes, only when we turn our eyes to God can we rightly see our insignificance, Jen says, our insignificance within creation and our significance to our creator, right? Because we are kind of insignificant in the grand scheme of things, but we are, we are significant to our creator. He created us in his image. We are loved by him and we are chosen um, by him. We are called by him to be part of his family and part of his plan. Um, you know, I love in the story of Esther when Mordecai is like, Esther, you can be part of this or you cannot. God's going to find a way to deliver his people. We're going to survive. It's up to you whether you take part or not. Um, and that really just kind of shook me to my core a little bit because I mean, you know, you get busy, you, you sit on the sidelines, but you know, God has chosen us and he desires us, to, desires to spend time with us and desires to use us as part of his plan. Um, and that is a huge, immense privilege when we look at God as this amazing, infinite, omnipotent Lord of the universe. And yet he chooses us these extremely limited beings to be, you know, his, his, his voice to the lost. Um, but yes, so what is rightly seeing? It means seeing God with a proper theology. Um, we talked in those early weeks about our theology and the fact that we all have a theology. We all have a way that we think about God. Um, we don't necessarily think that we have a theology, but we all think about God in a certain way, which reveals our theology. And, it, and um, what our theology is kind of affects 
everything in our life. It affects how we pray. It reflects our actions. It reflects, it reflects in our attitude. Um, but yes, rightly seeing means seeing God as he has revealed himself in scripture. So anything else, any other God that um, are the, any other God than the God revealed in the Bible is not God. And it is an empty idol. So God re has revealed himself in the Bible. Anything else, any other creation we can think of, we can take apart bits that we don't like, but that's not the true God. That is an idol. That is not a, that is not God with a capital G. That is a God with a little G. And we don't want to do with anything worshiping anything other than the God of scripture. But this is the God of scripture, wholly worthy of our worship and worthy to put on the throne of our hearts. He is worthy to be our king and holy sovereign over our lives. So um, yeah, my hope is that you guys continue to um, seek God in scripture, seek to know him um, and continue to see him in a way that is worthy of him, you know? And so I have a little gift for you guys my favorite people who made it to week six. <laughs> oh, this is recording. I shouldn't say that. <laughs> but um, so I, I call this all, I made a bold claim. I, I call this all theologians because my hope is that you all um, dedicate yourself to um, knowing God and fearing God and knowing God rightly um, for the rest of your time here on earth. And then you will be join the Lord in heaven and you will continue to know him deeper for all eternity. But I have little stickers for you with um, Proverbs 2, 1 through 15 on it. And it says theologian because you're all a theologian. So you can stick it on a Bible. I've stuck mine on my water bottle, <laughs> but, but yeah, it's a little vinyl sticker. I was admiring this. Oh, thank, thank you. you. <laughs> yes. So there you go. Or you can just stick it on a notebook page and journal all around it or, or whatnot. But, but yeah, so, um, what? Did you make them? Uh, Sam did, actually. Oh, nice. Sam made these for us. Thank you. Uh, yeah. <laughs> no. <laughs> this is, yeah, he, he didn't make baked goods, but he made stickers, <laughs> which, you know, fewer calories, but you can eat it if you want. <laughs> yeah, so there you go. Um, but yeah, so yeah, I think one um, practical application with... Um, with this that you guys could uh, could try to do but i would say as you're reading your reading your bible you're doing your reading plans this year or this month or whatever it is i would suggest taking a highlighter and picking a color um a single color or multiple colors um it's up to you but taking a color and deciding this is going to be the color of God's attributes. So anytime you're reading through scripture and you see an attribute of God, like God is something he reveals about himself. Like um, if you find scripture that speaks to God's infinite nature or his eternal nature, um, you know, his omniscience, highlight it and write his attribute next to it. Um, so as you're reading through scripture, the knowledge that we have gained is just being cemented more um, in your minds. Um, then yeah, that's just a Bible study technique I wanted to share with you guys. But yeah, just highlight his characteristics um, in your Bible with, a, with the same color. So when you see, you know, anytime you're flipping through scripture and you see blue and you're, you're like, oh, that's a characteristic of God right there. Oh, what does this passage speak to? Oh, this speaks to his sovereignty. You know, Job 42 you know, none of the plans of God can be thwarted, um, things like that. So you can also continue to go, go back through this book, go back through our notes, look back at our, um, old references, just, um, just refresh those, highlight those in your Bible. Um, you can use, even use little ta colorful tabbies too, but like <laughs> if you're, <laughs> if you like having a colorful Bible, like I do, um, but yeah, so that's all I have for us today. Um, I'm trying to figure out this is Sam's tablet. I'm like, how do you get that cover back on? Um, but yeah, so really, thank you all for joining me um, in this study. I, you know, it's always nerve wracking for me preparing for these things just because um, the responsibility 
weighs heavily on me, but I also covet the opportunities because I feel like God teaches me so much in the preparation and I learn new things too from our discussions around the tables too. You guys all have wonderful thoughts. I've enjoyed being able to sit at, I think everybody's table at least once um, to kind of hear your heart and get to know you a little bit more. But um, this has been wonderful and I've always looked forward to it every Tuesday. So anyways, let me close this in prayer and we'll head out. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for this time. We thank you for the work of your Holy Spirit who has revealed yourself to us in our hearts. God, I just pray that we would continue to be awed by your amazing um, magnitude, your power. I just pray that we would look for you um, as we go throughout our weeks, God, even in the busyness, we would look to be amazed by you. Um, we would look to be astounded by you and awed. Um, I pray that in our study that you continue to reveal the truth of who you are um, to these women. And I pray that you continue to work in their hearts and reveal um, knowledge of who they are, um, God. And I just pray that you continue to grow them in discipleship um, through, through fellowship and study and prayer. God, I just pray that this Bible study just lights a fire in all of them to continue to pursue you um, for all their days on this earth, God, before they are able to see you fully in heaven. God, I just... I just rejoice and I praise you in, in imagining the sweetness of getting to see you face to face, Lord. God, we praise you and we worship you and we just, we give you tonight and we give you, give you all of this, God. We just pray that you continue to use it. Um, transform us, make us more like your son. In your name I pray, amen. So in case you're wondering why we haven't gotten to anything on the left side of our list, um, that's because Jen has a follow-up book um, to this. It's called In His Image, and it is about um, the attributes of God that we are able to be like Him. So if you are interested in continuing that because... God's incommunicable attributes, the attributes only he has, is just a fraction of who he is. There's also ways that we can be like God, um, and that is holy, loving, just, good, merciful, gracious, long-suffering, wise, jealous for his glory, faithful, righteous, and truthful. So there's a whole lot of huge subjects in there. But yes, he, she has a follow-up book in his image, and if you enjoyed this book, you enjoyed her writing, you enjoyed her um, diligent um, dedication to scripture, um, I highly suggest um, picking up in his image um, to read on your own. So anyways, that's all. Thank you. Thank you.